Dallas Mavericks have themselves a new head coach and a new GM. We knew this, but we finally, after a frankly long delay, got a chance to have these introductory press conferences yesterday, or I really suppose it was just a introductory press conference, not multiple. My mind is still thinking a little bit in terms of Big 12 media days where I was Wednesday and Thursday. But we've had a chance now to hear from new Mavericks coach Jason Kidd. We've had a chance to hear from Nico Harrison, from Sent Marshall, from Mark Cuban. And there's a lot to drink in. First of all, I noted only three Mavericks were mentioned by name, those being Luka Doncic, Kristaps Porzingis, and Josh Green. I don't think this is a coincidence. I think this is because the roster, at the very least, they're not committing to anything long term. Anybody. Anybody is officially available if it moves towards the ultimate goal for this team to get better. Luka's there. Jason Kidd seemed to imply that he thinks Kristaps Porzingis is a perfect fit. That he's even the phrase he used, a perfect fit alongside Luka. He not only seemed to suggest that he was ready to coach KP, but that he was excited to coach KP. Now, here's a couple things to consider here. If, uh, if you're looking at it in these terms, I said anyway, once Rick Carlisle moved out and Donnie Nelson moved out, I said anyway that I thought there was a better than good chance KP was going to play here, at least for the first half of this next season, because the, the ability is undeniable. You look at a guy that's 25 going on 26, what he's able to bring to the game, and we talked a lot in the playoff series against the Clippers. I don't think that was the ceiling for KP <laughs> at all. I don't think that he fell that far, that hard off of the cliff. I felt like it was a matter of what the Mavericks asked him to do, and you can say, hey, if they didn't have faith in him to do more than this, then isn't that a problem? Yes, it is. And he's going to have to address those things. But I also think he was capable of giving more than he was asked to do. And he just kind of went along with what he was asked to do. So now with the new regime, you're going to have a new coach in here, Jason Kidd, who believes that he can solve the mystery with Porzingis. That he can figure out how to get this guy back on track, back performing like the unicorn. And if that's the case with uh, the new GM and the new head coach, they're going to want to take that shot before they move on. Especially because if you did move on right now, you would be selling so low in terms of value. You would be essentially getting pennies on the dollar at best. It doesn't make sense to move him right now, even with his contract. Yes, there are complications there that we've talked about. Luca is going to sign his Supermax this summer. And your window now for building a contender around this team before cap starts to become a little bit concerning is pressing. But that's a different discussion. All you need to know for that takeaway is that the Mavericks mentioned three players by name. Josh Green being among them is very promising, by the way. That tells me that they actually do believe and what he can bring to the team long term. What we've seen with him playing uh, with the Australian team right now in the Olympics has been, or the qualifiers, has been very encouraging as well. I, I hope that he can bring a lot to this team moving forward. And it kind of did speak to the overall Carlisle trend that unless you are sensational like Luca was, or unless you are in a just utter desperate situation where you have nothing else, as was the case prior to Luca with Dennis Smith Jr., who even in his own right had certain limitations when it came to minutes and situational opportunities, Rick Carlisle was not going to play rookies. That's just not what he does. So hopefully you get a chance now to develop Josh Green moving forward. But Mark Cuban did also mention, I mentioned the three Mavericks that were mentioned by name. I'm talking in that case of Kid. Cuban also when someone else asked about it in the Q&A portion of it, Cuban also uh, alluded to not just... The question had Tyrell Terry, and it had, I think Cuban threw in Nate Hinton, but it had Tyler Bay as well. It had these other young guys that are now going into their first NBA offseason, and, you know, hey, what are, you, what are your expectations? What are your hopes for them? Are you still optimistic about their futures? 
Cuban said, absolutely, and don't forget Nate Hinton. That was his throwing. But that was really the only time it came up, and it wasn't because they brought him up. There's a reason I mentioned the first three guys. Those are the ones that they actually talked about. Now, on the Jason Kidd front, if you saw the community tab, you saw I referred to him as J Kidd Bot. His introductory comment, his opening comments, he might as well have been reading off a teleprompter. Now, there wasn't a teleprompter, but that felt so robotic and so rehearsed. There was no emotion. It was completely flat. And I know J Kidd does not have a lot of range to his speaking patterns and things like that. But it was so monotone and flat and just not engaging <laughs> that I was I was like, man, I really hope this is not what every J-Kid press conference is going to be. I'm hoping this is just because the Mavericks are aware of the criticism that they have faced because of uh, his past domestic violence in incident 20 years ago, all the way back in 2000, the 2000-2001 season, because of their kind of bracing for that and they danced very carefully around that the entire press conference that came up two or three times and I'm hoping that he was just so coached on it and he's beaten down by it too I'm sure that he just kind of like all right let me just kind of push through this get through this however I have to here's my generic introductory quote and then we'll open things up. I'm going to have to talk about it a little bit, and I'm going to give fairly standard run-of-the-mill answers even then. Now, he opened up a little bit when they got into the Q&A. He had a very kind of cringeworthy comment at one point. I'm hoping he was intending this as a joke. Uh, when he was asked if he had been in contact with Luca since then, you know, if it had been a phone call or something else, he said, yes, I have uh, talked with him on the phone. But then sounding like the ultimate old guy, basically like, well, you know, kids today, they have, I already put too much personality in his answer just with my mimicking there. Kids today, they, they are other ways to contact and communicate as well. And that's through text messaging. And that's just something that us old heads have to kind of uh, work around and older guys and stuff like that. It's like, bro, text messaging has been around since the 90s. Like, almost my entire lifetime. The first text message was sent in, like, 1992. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it'd be one thing if you were talking about, like, Snapchat or some kind of social media platform or, hell, FaceTime. All right, uh, whatever. But text messaging? Bro, you were texting while you were in the league. And you've been out of the league for about a decade. So what the hell are you talking about? I don't... That was a cringeworthy moment that I'm hoping just because he has no, or at least in this press conference, so little range of personality, it seemed like. I am hoping that it just didn't come across as a joke when it was intended to be a joke. Because if you're already so old guy, old head, that you can't wrap your head around communicating with players of today via texting you're you're going to have a short career as a coach because you're going to be old and out of touch with your players very quickly because I'm pretty sure even Rick Carlisle can wrap his head around text messaging. I digress. So in all of these answers, Kid has to talk about the domestic stuff. Uh, Sent Marshall talks about, you know, in her case, she's a survival, survivor of domestic violence as well. And so she directly had a conversation with Kid in their process and they determined that and we know how they're going to go about this, basically determined that it doesn't violate their standards and their kind of code of conduct that they established when she came in. It's as long ago as it is, his first wife and everything like that, and how everything has been addressed, how he's talked about it a little bit. And it feels like they're essentially saying they didn't feel like there were any concerns there, and for the standards that they've already set in prior to this change of guard that it all is in alignment with it now as it relates to contacting Luca and talking with him he said that yeah there's been some conversations he says essentially with regard to Luca there aren't really weaknesses to his game it's more just a matter of and it's not said as an insult he's 22 like there's a lot to learn and grow and continue in that regard it's not just like it's not like saying 
hey, he doesn't do this well on the court and he's going to have to work on that. No, he didn't talk about that. He didn't go Donnie Nelson route and say, like, he needs to do a better job getting his teammates involved. He did talk about the possibility, did Jason Kidd, of having Luka not be as ball dominant, having situations where other guys bring the ball up the court, which is kind of a funny thing to hear him talk about because I don't remember that ever being a case for Jason Kidd having uh, consistently someone else do it. Now, there were situations, I guess, so depending on how much his usage of that is, you know, we we can have a conversation there. But you did have, obviously, Jason Terry, who played with him, and in that regard, Terry was a starting point guard on the 2006 finals team. So, you know, there there was certainly experience in that department. But Jason Kidd, we know, kind of wanted to run things his way on the floor, and even from the sidelines as a coach, that was a problem for him, not wanting to cede that control. So he's going to have to do that here. He's going to have to be willing to do that with Luka because you can't try to put Luka too much under your thumb. You have to let him improvise and be creative and uh, see the game as he does because it is as special and unique as any player in the league, in the world, really, in that regard. So... A couple other things that were discussed here is that, you know, Cuban stresses that Porzingis did exactly what he was asked to do in the playoffs, that he is better and he thinks he's been much maligned. Again, I think this is all the kind of stuff you would expect them to say, especially if they're trying to say, like, you know, we're probably going to have to roll with the dice on this, so we're not going to badmouth the dude. We want to build up the relationship and make it sound as positive and promising still as it can be moving forward. And just for anyone who is out in there, the other teams listening by chance, we want to make you know that like, no, we're happy with this because we know what we did wrong and we're fixing it now. Whatever. They're not going to make it sound like he's an untouchable, irredeemable player because I don't think he is. And I don't think they think he is. But I also think even if he was, would you expect them to go out there and say that? No, no chance. So... You know, Cuban joked uh, even having to like tell his own kids that KP is better than they think. And I'm like, ooh, that, that's an interesting sound when you have the owner acknowledging like, yeah, my kids pretty much think he sucks. Like, ooh, okay. But even with that being the case, you still have uh, a core there where you're going to have Luca. You're going to, I think, for at least the short term longer have KP. They talked about the development of Josh Green. They talked about Luka not being as ball dominant. Yes, they addressed the Jason Kidd domestic issues. And I was surprised in the case of Nico Harrison how little he talked. I called him shy guy Nico. It's not that he was shy. He just didn't talk a lot. And even the questions that were directed to him, I felt like his answers were very short and didn't give a lot of insight. You could look at this entire press conference yesterday and say there was not a lot of new information shed. Like the whole thing was like 40 minutes, 43 minutes, something like that. There was not a lot of new insight to be gained from this other than Kid seems to believe in Porzingis as a perfect fit next to Luca. They did talk about Josh Green and uh, their hopes to develop him and get him more exposure. And even then, you're I, even in that statement, I'm whether you want to say reading between the lines or I'm um, paraphrasing it in a way that might even be slightly stronger than they said. That's a fair critique, but they didn't talk about a lot of other guys on this roster, and I think it's because they understand that anything could happen, like any move, any deal could happen where they're going to reshape this roster. Nico stressed that his relationship isn't just with the premier talents in the league, but also guys of all classes. He said for the last 19 years he's been with Nike, that he has graded and uh, gauged every draft class. And as such, even though the Mavericks don't have a first-round pick, he feels confident that he really has a pulse, a feel on the pulse of this draft class. Okay, Uh, we'll, we'll see how that plays out, but... It was a lot of short statements like that, or a lot of him just saying, like, basically, yeah, I agree with Jason. Well, we want to hear from you. He said that, yes, there had been opportunities in the past for him to move up, but to him, Nike was a dream job in and of itself, 
And for him to leave a dream job, he felt like he had to be stepping into a dream job. He says that around early 2000, when he first was starting out with Nike, he did live actually in Dallas, and he did work with Dirk, with Nash, the Mavericks. And so he already was kind of ingratiated to this area. And he looked at it and he said, well, you're looking at Kid for the coach. I like Kid as the coach. I like Dallas. You've got one of, the, one of, if not the brightest young star in the NBA right now in Luka. So all of these boxes are checked for this to be a great destination to be at. And they've got salary cap to work with. This seems like even with all of the, all of the upheaval that we've seen in the last few weeks, that this is a good place to be. Now, there was one thing that stood out to me, and to me this was a Freudian slip that was actually telling. Uh, it was someone basically asking Mark if, like, to what extent, and I'm paraphrasing the question, to what extent he ceded control of final basketball decisions to Nico. Mark's answer was, Basically, the buck stops with me because all of this costs a lot of money. When you're talking about $100 million deals, $200 million deals, the guy signing the checks has to be able to sign off on that. And he basically looked to Nico and said, like, does that sound fair? And Nico was like, yeah, that sounds fair. Like, very, like, they did it in, like, a joking way, but it's also one of those things where you're kind of like, I see why you didn't go after certain uh, free agent general managers with championship experience because yeah that would not be an answer that would fly with anybody I feel like that's something that given Nico hasn't been a GM before and this is new to him even though he does have an eye for talent and these relationships he's built and player evaluation even though those are all true I still think that that was a troubling thing for me. Something that I kind of was like, hmm, that seems to kind of reinforce what I don't like. Speaking of, oh, hold on. I almost skipped over the actual Freudian slip. So when Mark was talking about Nico's experience, he was attempting to basically say that uh, he's helped all of these guys. He has basically helped these people around him uh, succeed, that he has uh, helped them succeed to raise their their levels of production, their gains, what value, whatever. And he said, at times you just have to succeed. But he Freudian slipped and said, concede. So as he's talking about with Nico in that regard, he's like, sometimes you just have to know when to concede or when it's uh, succeed. Like he corrected himself. But I was like, hmm, that almost sounds like you're saying like the GM in this case has to know when to concede to the owner because this was right around that time. Uh, he basically like in the same answer that he was giving, talking about the buck stops with me, the owner, in terms of final decisions. So yeah, that's that was troubling. That whole answer bothered me a bit. Speaking of bothering me a little bit, was the answer related to uh, Bob Harlebo? Yes, Bob Bob Volgaris. Mark would not commit to an answer one way or the other on his status with the Mavericks. When simply asked if he was still going to be with this team moving forward, his contract is set to expire this summer. Mark immediately, barely let the question ring out all the way before he literally said, we don't discuss who is or is not on our payroll. I have never done that. Just completely brushed it away, slapped it out to half court, like it was a, a layup attempt or something, and that was it. That is concerning as hell to me. If you give any answer there. Now, the reporter's follow-up question is like, all right, well then, can you tell me what the influence in terms of the power structure looks like here? Mark said, there's me, there's Nico, there's Kid, there's Scent. And, and it's funny, he's like, that's never changed. Well, Kid and Nico weren't there, so that's changed. And you had Donnie and Rick in place before, but the fact that he is still pushing back on this idea that Bob Bulgaris has like significant input and helps change the direction of certain deals. I mean, we have situations where 
there were multiple instances where sources around the league in the fallout of all this stuff happening like last month were basically saying like, yeah, we were trying to make a deal with the Mavericks, Miami Heat among them. We were trying to make a deal with the Mavericks and the confusion came about. We didn't know which GM basically we had to talk to. This is why they called him a shadow GM. We talked to Donnie and we have one understanding of the deal in place. We talked to this person, we have a different understanding. That's why we thought Goran Dragic was coming to Dallas in that deal at one point. And then it turned out, nope, actually, no, he's not. It, it, the whole thing is a cluttered mess. And that, that's why the deal eventually fell through. But like, it, it's a cluttered mess. It really, really is. And Mark not committing one way or another to it. It almost feels like he's just trying to push that guy into the background again. Like, no, 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 go step back into the shadows where you were. And we'll deal with this when we have to deal with it. That's kind of how it feels like this is being treated. And I don't like that because a simple answer, if he is gone, a simple answer of Bob did a lot of great work for, and this is peeing completely PC. Bob did a lot of great work for us the past few years. His contract is set to expire and... You know, we'll uh, we'll have a conversation with him between now and then and see if it's still a fit moving forward. But as of right now, there have not been, there has not been a decision made. You're still leaving the door open with that answer, but you're issuing some degree of assurance. And the fact that he gave the answer he gave just rings as like basically a giant a giant f you while holding up a sign saying like. He's still here, bitches. Like, he's not going anywhere. That's concerning. And I want to see what influence and decision-making Nico Harrison actually has. Because if you're going to tell me that Bob is kind of running things and Nico is basically just, like, the face with the relationships and things like that, that's not good. I don't want a co-GM situation. I don't. That is not good or beneficial to this team that I, in my opinion, like... Based on what we've seen in decision making in recent years, that doesn't work. If they're not on the same page, it does not work. So, I don't know. Those are my basic takeaways from the Mavericks introductory press conference yesterday. Uh, you know, not a lot of new information ascertained. A little bit of interest as far as KP, as far as the, the hierarchy, if you will. But other than that, we're just going to have to see. We're going to have to wait until we get to Mavericks Media Day, and maybe we'll get some additional insight there. In the meantime, we've got a draft coming up. Mavericks don't have anything going on in the first round. Uh, we'll see what they end up doing overall. Obviously, free agency is going to kick off. I'm about to record immediately another video because there is another report that uh, one of those guys we've been talking about, as uh, even if we talked about it in a pipe dream scenario, is reportedly requesting a trade. Drop a like on this video, leave a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, and until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace!